Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Science Friday live stream. Happy Cephalopod Week, by the way. I am uh, well attired for today. I left my squid hat at the office, but um, you can just imagine me wearing that today. Um, I'm Diana. I am the Experiences Manager for Science Friday, and I am joining you from the first official day of summer. Happy summer as well to everyone in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, joining you here from sunny Brooklyn, New York. It is so nice to see you all in the comments. Uh, let us know, speaking of which, um, in the comments where you are joining us from. We would love to know. Uh, you do have to sign into a YouTube account to join us in the chat. Uh, so you can do that and the chat should be either on the right side or just below uh, here so that you can join us there. We've got a bunch of people letting us know, North Florida, Sacramento, San Francisco, Hudson Valley River, Oak Park, Illinois, Houston, Texas, Earth, love it. Um, and Cleveland, Ohio, amazing. Let, keep letting us know where you are joining us from. Um, and I'm just gonna keep going along. If you don't know us, Science Friday is your one-stop shop for all things science news. And we'll, we're well known for our weekly science radio show broadcast every week on, you guessed it, Friday with founder and host Ira Flato. You can listen to us live every Friday from uh, 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time on your local radio station or by visiting sciencefriday.com and clicking, clicking the listen banner at the top of your page. But today we are gathering with the author of this month's read, a nonfiction book about the long reign of cephalopods titled Monarchs of the Sea, the extraordinary 500 million year history of cephalopods by author and squid biologist Dan Stoff. And we'll be joined by fellow squid biologist uh, Sarah McAnulty. Very excited to have them both here. Um, and we want to, if you want to join fellow readers to discuss our book picks together, you can join our Mighty Network community. I'll put a link in the chat. It is a great place just to you know, uh, meet other people, join our book club and uh, do other kinds of cool stuff throughout the month. It is one of my favorite things that I do with my job. So I hope you will join us there. A kind reminder before we get started, Science Friday is committed to providing a welcoming and harassment free environment for members of all ethnicities, ages, gender and trans, trans statuses, sexual orientation, physical disabilities, national origin, beliefs, or any other dimension of diversity. We've created a code of conduct, which actually you can find in its, in, in its entirety in our community space. So you can join in or look for it there. Uh, and that helps us create a safe and positive experience for everyone. And we believe that providing clear expectations is a necessary part of building a respectful community. So here are the basics. Be supportive and respectful when speaking with one another or asking questions in the comments. Share generously and listen openly. Um, you can add questions throughout, thoughts throughout, even if they aren't strictly questions. We want to hear about your experience reading the book or with cephalopods or anything in between. We're going to do our best to stay on topic today. We're here to discuss this month's book club pick, which is Monarchs of the Sea, as I mentioned before, and just related topics. Um, and we've res reserved the right to ban anyone who engages in demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in the chat today. All right. Thank you for sticking with me. I'm going to put those code of conduct bases here in the chat. So if you ever want to refer to them, that is the place to find them. But it is officially time to introduce our guests to the stage. So joining me first is Dana Stoff. She is a science writer and marine biologist. She earned her PhD in invertebrate paleo, uh, but not invertebrate, paleontology is almost what I just said, invertebrate biology from Stanford University and has studied cephalopods, particularly squid through research and writing. She is the author of multiple books, including Monarchs of the Sea, which we read this month for the book club, um, as well as a bunch of other books that she should tell us all about today. She lives in Northern Cal California. Welcome, Dana. It is so nice to see you here. Thank you for having me. Yes. And we have one more guest who is joining us. Sarah McAnulty is uh, the ever amazing squid biologist and science communicator who studied the symbiotic relationship between Hawaiian bobtail squid and the bioluminescent bacteria that live within them, Vibrio fisheri. After earning her PhD from the University of Connecticut, she founded Skype a Scientist, a nonprofit that connects classrooms across the country with scientists via the internet. She lives in Philadelphia. Nice to have you back, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah. So a reminder to our audience, we want your questions. So at any time during the event, if you have a question or comment for our guests, you can put them in the chat and we will try to get to as many of them as humanly possible. So 
to start off, Dana, I introduced you briefly, but would you mind just telling us in your own words what it is that you do? Because you do a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a scientist and a science communicator. Um, I spent a number of years in the lab and on the water studying marine biology, mostly squid. And now I spend most of my time writing and illustrating and speaking about science. Uh, which I love. I love being an author. I love writing science books and talking to people about science books because it really, um, it's really just this sweet spot of all the things that I enjoy doing. I get to learn really cool science, dive into science rat holes and ask questions of scientists and then share everything that I've learned with other people. And uh, yeah, that's what I do. It's good times. Amazing. Sarah, your work is similar, but different. Can you tell us a little bit in your own words? Yeah, uh, there seems to be a thing about people who get a PhD in squid. A lot of us uh, <laughs> just get infected with how absolutely amazing squid are and then need to tell as many people as possible, which sometimes often leads us into careers in science communication. Um, there are a lot of us that ended up in science <laughs> communication, actually. Um, anyway, um, okay, so I, yeah, I run a, a science education nonprofit called Skype a Scientist. We match up classrooms, uh, we match up scientists with classroom scout troops, groups of adults, libraries, anybody who needs a scientist, we will get you one. Um, but we also communicate science on the street with street art, with murals, with all kinds of public art. Um, we run events every now and again too. Uh, and yeah, so I'm just trying to connect as many people with science as humanly possible, often through squid, because those are my favorite things uh, mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, but it's not always communicating about squid depending on who we're talking with. Awesome. All right, so we're going to get into sort of like the details now. I want to I want to get back to the book. So we read Monarchs of the Sea. I've got my copy right here. Um, I loved it, and so many people loved it. And actually, Sarah, you recommended this book to me when I was looking for um, when I was looking for books to focus on for Cephalopod Week. Dana, why go all the way back to the very beginning for a book about cephalopods? Why not just start with the octopuses and squid that we might encounter in the oceans or at our local aquariums? This is such a good question because, um, I mean, for me, uh, as well as I think for most people who even know what cephalopods are and like them, our fascination starts with the ones we can see, the ones that we've met. I, like for me, it was a giant Pacific octopus that I met in an aquarium. Um, for some people, it might be calamari that they meet on their dinner plate. But whatever it is, it's something that we share the earth with right now. These animals that seem almost alien, that have the ability to look back at us, but also have absolutely no bones in their bodies. Uh, that's what got me into them, right? So um, so the, the interesting thing is when I was finishing up my PhD and switching, sort of switching gears a bit from being a, a full-time academic more towards spending most of my time in science communication, I had this opportunity come across my plate to write a book about cephalopods. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was, and so I was like, yes, of course. Um, but also as I was crafting this proposal, I was well aware that there were a lot of books about cephalopods already. You know, not a million, but more even than had been available when I was a kid getting into them. Um, just off the top of my head, there was Wendy Williams' Kraken, which is about squid. She actually came to our lab when I was in grad school to talk to some of the researchers that oh, were cool. Um, there's Catherine Harmon Courage's Octopus with an exclamation point because they're <laughs> awesome. Um, and so I felt like I didn't want to sort of retread that ground. There was already like some mm. really great books out there. But the other reason I, th and so then I started sort of stretching, you know, what, what do I want to write? What would a book look like? And what I realized is when you are really into somebody like a celebrity and you pick up a biography of that person, you don't want to just know what they're doing now. You don't want to just know what shows they're doing, what where they live right now, who they're currently married to, because you probably know a lot of that stuff already. Um, what you really want when you pick up a biography is to find out all the stuff you didn't know about their past. You know, where was this person born? What was their childhood like? What sort of traumas did they have to overcome to become this like amazing, famous person that we know now? And so that's kind of what I wanted to do for cephalopods. Cephalopods have always been my celebrity of choice. And so there were, I had all these questions about them because I didn't have a degree in paleontology. Um, I actually knew relatively little about their fossil history before I started researching the book. And it's what I wanted to know, basically like where were the cephalopods born? What was their childhood like? Uh -huh. What traumas did they endure to become these fabulous things that we know and love today? 
I love that. Yeah, a lot of people respond to that too. Here's a, a, a comment from Meredith who says, I also love how readable it is. It didn't feel dry. It felt like an excited friend info dumping about their favorite things. So delightful. Um, that's so great to hear. Um, do you get that a lot, Dana? Do you get people saying like, it just felt like you were just talking to me, but in book form? It does. And it's interesting because I didn't really think a lot about trying to put my voice in it, but it turns out that I have spent the majority of my life info dumping about cephalopods excitedly <laughs> at the dinner table. And so <laughs> that's just how it came out. Um, and I figured I would also take this opportunity to answer a couple of small questions about the book that, that have already come up because- Please. When it first came out in 2017, it was not called Monarchs of the Sea. Um, and it was this book. Oh, it's too bright. Let me. There we go. There we are. Uh, Squid Empire, The Rise and Fall of the Cephalopods. This was the first edition of the book. Um, it's very similar to Monarchs of the Sea when they came out with a second edition. Um, in addition to changing the title and getting a new cover, I had the opportunity to add new research in, which made me realize how fast even like the study of ancient things, you know, every month there are new paleontological papers coming up. So it was fun to get some of that in there and also to get in some of this art um, that was made after Squid Empire came out, um, but before Monarchs of the Sea. So, so some of those cool things by the, the artist Franz Anthony, I was able to put in, which was very exciting. Yeah. Um, and then the question about voice also reminded me that the, there was a question about an audiobook. So there's an audiobook of Squid Empire. Mm -hmm. but not of Monarchs of the Sea because of complicated publishing copyright things that I yeah. don't completely understand. Uh, but there may be one day. Um, so yeah, you can't. Yeah. It's funny that you say about um, research coming out. Cause I think one of the things I looked up because I was, I was like, I remember seeing something about ram's horn squid recently. And I think that they discovered that instead of having its head this way, it actually has its head, or instead of having it this way, it has its head this way. So it's, its shell is underneath it. But um, there, it just seems like there's so much research that is just happening, like you mentioned, like on a monthly basis. There's just like, I get PR releases every month and just being like, here's another cephalopod <laughs> thing. Here's another cephalopod thing. Um, Sarah, do you find yourself um, having to sort of like keep up with the research? Like you're just like prowling through the, the journals. Do they get sent to you? Is it like just a monthly info dump? Great question. I think a lot of times at this point when new cephalopod stuff comes out, people tag me on social media. So mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful for all of those people because then I don't need to um, be browsing the table of contents of the, these journals. Um, I just hear about it on social media. Also, a lot of squid biologists are like talking to each other all the time, uh, mostly on Twitter, um, which is an issue for us. Uh, we're like, <laughs> trying to find a new place to go. Um, but yeah, we we talk, we talk to each other so much that when like so a lot of times, particularly with studying deep sea cephalopods, mm -hmm. there will be these ROV dives, the remote operated vehicle. Um, they basically chuck a robot into the ocean and see what it sees in real time. And so there are these folks that just um, you know maybe while they're at work, their second screen is just the dive. Um, and when a cephalopod pops up, I will hear about it a couple times over, and it's great because then I get to see like what they saw that day. And sometimes, like you were saying, it's like new stuff all the time, um, particularly in the last decade when more people um, have phones on them with good cameras mm -hmm. all the time, we see more encounters that we get footage of. So now um, we think of there being like a giant squid season uh, in Japan. It's in January. That's when like a bunch of giant squid show up on social media. And so, yeah, we didn't really have access to all of that before, and we do now. So it's a lot to keep up on, but it's all exciting. Yeah. Speaking of which, keeping up on things, um, like I said before, when I was looking for a read for Cephalopod Week, I asked you, you know, what books are out there? What should I be paying attention to? And as a squid scientist, what made it stand, what made uh, this book, Monarchs of the Sea, stand out amongst the dozens of other cephalopod focused books? Good question. I mean, first of all, it's the only cephalopod book that I was aware of, particularly that's so easy to read, that looks way back in time. And it covered things that 
like I didn't know that I would be interested in necessarily. I like learning about animals that are alive today. Um, I like being able to watch videos of them doing their thing. Um, I'm I'm not as interested in paleontology or so I thought, um, but reading Dana's book back in 2017 when, um, right before it first came out, I uh, was just like, it was a page turner. And I love that about it. Um, I remember thinking like, I didn't think that I would be like on the edge of my seat for things that have been dead for millions of years, but there I was like really enjoying it. So um, that's a testament to how, uh, to how much I just love that book. Also, there's a lot of books and media out there about octopuses. Um, Dana is a big octopus person. I just want to see more squid out there. You know, I want to see more people talking about squid in addition to octopuses. And while a lot of the animals discussed uh, in Monarchs of the Sea are like pre-squid, um, you get some more cephalopod diversity in there that we're talking about, and that brings me joy. Yeah, I love that. All right, Dana, we're, we'll keep nerding out about the book, and like almost like you're not here, but you are here, which is a great, a great thing. So we want to ask you more questions. But um, I asked this question to our community page, and I'm going to ask you as well. Um, what cephalopod, like ancient cephalopod survival tactics, do you think that current day cephalopods would do well to learn in order to thrive in our modern and ever changing ocean? Because we continue to affect our world in a way that affects the oceans deeply as well. I think one of the things that was so interesting for me learning about the history of cephalopods, the childhood and adolescence of them, as it were, <laughs> is that they've faced so much environmental upheaval over their evolutionary history. Um, I think the number of mass extinctions that they've weathered is kind of mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, I, I sometimes try to get people excited about cephalopods and especially ancient extinct cephalopods that are not the octopuses that everybody knows about from popular uh, TV shows and aquariums and everything by saying they're they're like dinosaurs but better because uh, you know everybody loves dinosaurs they lived for a long time and they ruled the land and they were huge and they were scary and I'm like cephalopods were the same but for longer uh, so you know they go back twice as far as the earliest dinosaurs and they got really big and they got really weird and they got really scary and they had they they seem to have had over the course of their history this sort of flexibility, adaptability that I think we're still seeing in them today and understanding in ways that are really new and mind boggling. You know, speaking of new studies, there was just one that sort of was rocking the cephalopod world recently, as it were, was this RNA editing yes. that cephalopods can do. It's so cool. It's so cool, right? So um, the this ability that cephalopods seem to have sort of uniquely, it's not like no other animal can do it. As I understand, you know, and I'm not a molecular biologist, so like, feel free to jump in <laughs> other people who read the study, but it's, there are other animals that do it, but cephalopods do it uniquely a lot. Mm -hmm. Like they are just constantly translating from their DNA, which is the like set of instructions that all organisms have for how to build their bodies and how to build their pronates, translating that into RNA and then changing it before they go on to like actually make the proteins, which is just bizarre. And it makes me wonder how, how long have they been doing that for? Does that go back to the Jurassic? Does it go back to the Devonian? We don't currently have a way of knowing that, but one of the cool things about science is that we get more ways of knowing as it, like we, we get more knowledge, but we also get more ways of knowing. And I love that. So, so we may be able to answer something like that. Um, so I definitely copped out and did not answer your question at all, Diana, um, <laughs> by instead, like just talking about cool things that cephalopods do. But I think that the thing is there aren't any, to my mind, any specific adaptations from the fossil record that you're like, oh man, I wish modern squid could evolve a really heavy phragmacone inside their body all over again. That would be great. Um, but it, would be, it would be kind of cool. I mean, regardless cool. of whether it's a good idea, that'd be cool. Yeah. Then we could collect them and that would be nice. But yeah, um, yeah the, uh, the, the flexibility of that seems to be intrinsic to their structures, their DNA is wild. Yeah, it really is. 
Um, I have more questions, but the, our audience has such good questions. So I'm going to go to a few of them right now. Um, we have one here that reads, convergent evolution is fascinating. Agreed. Are there any theories that elucidate the strategy? What makes the lens-based eye such an effective organ that it evolved independently in fish and squid? Uh, you talk a little bit about this in your book, Dana. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'd be interested to hear you think your thoughts about this too, Sarah, because um, I know you're a squid person and like we get very excited thinking about all the adaptations that they've got going on. And like so so one of the things that um that people say about squid that is this just goes to show how vertebrate biased people are is that they sometimes call squid the invertebrate fish. Hmm. You're like, okay, well you might as well call fish the vertebrate squid. Right. 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 So let's get that going. Um, but there are these fascinating similarities between those groups and the evolution of the eye is absolutely one of them that we know it evolved independently because the ancestors of squid and the ancestors of fish were not did, did not have an eye like this. You know, they, they split way before we had anything like a, a lens based eye. And um, it seems to be that often uh, there are pressures in the environment that really favor evolution along certain lines. Uh, and in the thing is, even though their, their ancestors are giving them different material to work with, both groups in terms of the squid and the fish are facing pretty much exactly the same pressures, the same light that's filtering to at different levels to different depths in the ocean, the same predators and the same options for prey. And when you think about it, um, what also happens a lot is divergent evolution in a way, you know, animals that will face, see those same pressures and be like, we can't really compete here. So we're going to evolve into totally different niches. Um, but I think the convergent evolution grabs our attention more because it's so surprising. Like, why do they both have lens based eyes? Um, so yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Sarah? The real like joy to me in um, studying cephalopods is seeing like where things line up and critically where they don't. So the eye is an extremely fun example of this because you have both at the same time. So in the retinas of our eyes, the back of our eyeballs, we've got rods and we've got cones and we've got three, most of us have three different types of cones and that's where all different parts of the visible spectrum of light. So different colors effectively, um, different uh, cones react to different colors so that we can in total see all the colors that most of us can see. We also have uh, rods that do like light dark. Okay, uh, cephalopods on the whole, for the most part, just have one type of color uh, receptor, so cone. Um, but, so, you know, we, we, we say they're colorblind, right? But that's not all of it. Uh, they also have the ability to see the direction that light is going, which is what we call polarized light. Mm. So any given like photons, so that's the smallest unit of light, it's got a direction and it's got a wavelength. The wavelength is the color, the direction is, you know, where it's, where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, we can only see the wavelength. We can't see the, the direction. We get like a, a semblance of that when we wear polarized sunglasses, but it's not, it's like, it's like a, a not great. Um, cephalopods can just see it, just see it completely right off the bat. So it's cool to see like, sure, the hardware um, of the lens is very similar between them and us, but like really what we're seeing and sensing with that lens uh, is, is can be pretty, pretty different. And that's fascinating to me. Yeah, that's really cool. It's like, I think that part of your book tries to kind of explain that, Dana, and I was just like, nah, my brain's not set up well to <laughs> understand at all what that means. So I'm just gonna leave it to the cephalopods to do that well. Um, Sarah, you recently visited Japan and you partly to actually collect stuffs that live around Yakushima Island near near Japan and bring them back to research labs and help cephalopod studies continue. Um, I know that there's a lot of labs that culture or breed cephalopods from egg to fully mature, but why is it important for us to continue to collect them from the oceans as well? Excellent question. So one of the things that I was studying um, during my PhD in Spencer and I Holmes lab at the University of Connecticut was this really cool symbiosis with uh, bacteria and squid and cuttlefish that only the females have. So they've got this uh, like tangled ball of tubes 
And within each of the tubes, there are bacteria that the female squid and cuttlefish will deposit into the, the coating of the squid and cuttlefish eggs. And so um, once the bacteria is in those eggs, they do a couple of really important things. They make antibiotics and they make antifungals and maybe other stuff that we don't know about yet. And that allows squid to lay their eggs and just leave them there um, because those antibiotics and antifungals protect the baby squid as it's developing. So it doesn't get what we call biofouling, just mm -hmm. like getting going bad kind of. Which if I could just jump in is a huge headache for trying to do in vitro fertilization <laughs> with these guys, right? Like we <laughs> tried so hard to make baby squid in the lab and we it was just such a struggle to replicate this amazing thing that the that the mothers do when they're actually producing the eggs themselves so yeah we're yes. just not nearly as good at it no nope. squid eggs are a real pain in the butt the the mbl up in woods hole is has figured out how to deal with that jelly but the jelly really makes it hard to get a needle into that's for sure mm -hmm. um, you gotta inject little like bits of uh, chemicals to do a lot of experiments uh with embryos um so anyway the the wild populations of squid and cuttlefish they get that bacteria that they then put in their eggs from their surrounding environment so when you have them in captivity for many generations in like these clean lab environments they might not have the same community that they would have in the wild so if you want to study that relationship you should really go get them from the ocean because that's going to have like the natural um, symbiont community, bacteria community that that you want to study. That's pretty cool. Awesome. All right. We've got more questions from our uh, our amazing uh, audience members here. Let's go to this question from Earl, which reads, what are the challenges to keeping larger squid in large modern aquaria like the Monterey Bay? Thinking of something like Humboldt squid. I mean, has anyone ever gotten a Humboldt squid into an aquarium? I, I'm not sure that's ever been done. Earl, were you in our lab in 20, <laughs> 2008, nine? I feel like somebody's going to accuse me of planting this question. No, it's an excellent question. And uh, we did try. Well, I was uh, in grad school. I was in the Hopkins Marine Station, which is a satellite campus of Stanford University in Monterey. So it's right next to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. There's a long history of collaboration between the scientists at Hopkins Marine Station and the scientists and aquarists at the aquarium, um, depending on you know what sort of thing you're studying. Sometimes there's a lot of back and forth. And my lab was working on Humboldt squid. Um, which are a very large species, not as large as the giant squid for which there is now a, a season. I actually didn't know that, Sarah. I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, but but it is a fairly large squid. They get to be uh, upwards of five feet in length in, as adults in total length. Uh, I'm five feet tall. Me so tall. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's me tall. Um, and the species is uh, endemic, uh, like that means it, it ha inhabits the waters of the Eastern Pacific, which means the Western Americas. So off the coast of South America, Central America, Mexico, um, and sometimes into California. And in the early 2000s, there was an invasion of Humboldt squid. There were a lot of headlines about it. Um, there were lots of these big squid showing up. Um, fish, uh, co recreational and commercial fishers were catching them. Sometimes they were washing up uh, in stranding events on the beach. Wow. And they were getting even further north than California, showing up as far north as Vancouver Island, um, and even a few in the southern Alaskan islands, which is way far north for them. So my whole lab was studying them, and we were trying to figure out um, you know, why are they here? Have they come in the past? It turns out that their range does periodically expand and contract. I was working on those babies, trying to get them to grow in little Petri dishes because I wanted to know if they could establish a population. Hmm. If the water's too cold for the babies, then they're never going to actually establish a population here unless the water warms significantly. Um, and it would just be adults moving to feed and then returning to warm water to spawn. Um, but there were also a number of people working on working with the adults, putting tags on them, figuring out where they're swimming and trying to keep them in aquaria. See, I was getting back to it. I just had to do a little info dump first. Uh, so we were working with one of the the amazing aquarists at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Chad Widmer, who had done a bunch of their jellyfish work, like really breakthrough stuff for keeping jellyfish happy and content in captivity. And 
we were trying to figure out how to do it for squid. And you look at this huge tank where they can keep tuna, uh, they can keep sharks, they keep sunfish until they get way too big and have to be airlifted out. You're like, why couldn't you put a Humboldt squid there? And it turns out that uh, you pretty much can't. And the reason is because they're super delicate. Even though they seem really big and sturdy, cephalopod skin is way more delicate than any fish skin. They don't have scales. They don't have the rough sort of toothy skin that sharks have. They certainly don't have the leathery skin of a turtle. And if they bump into anything, which is bound to happen in any enclosed space, it ends up tearing their skin. They get abrasions. Those abrasions get infected um, and they just can't handle it, which is why octopuses are the cephalopod of choice for aquariums, because they're not active swimmers in most cases. They are actually more like us. They like to have a little home and hang out in their little home um, and watch uh, octopus TV, which is looking out of their home at everything else that's going by and all of the weird humans that are walking on the other side of the glass. And so they don't tend to bang into things. They don't tend to have this issue. But a big squid is always swimming and its skin is just too delicate to handle. That was that was what we concluded after after more than a year of trying. Scientists are always learning new things. And so I do think it'll be really cool if someday we can figure out a way to like keep them happy and content in captivity. But we're not there yet. Yeah. And so this is actually a difference, too, in the squid that are in labs a lot of times. Right, Sarah? Because... Um, I was just speaking with um, Joshua Rosenthal up at the MBL, and he was saying, you know, squid that that berry ends up being like, um, what, what, which the the kind of squid that the you bobtails. are actually researching, yeah, bobtails, yeah. right? They they yeah. they do this sort of burying um, uh, uh, thing that they like doing, and so yeah. they're a little bit easier to study as well. Is that right? Absolutely. So. Uh, the cuttlefishes and bobtails in particular are, are just easier to deal with in aquaria. Think about where these animals are living in their in their natural wild situations. Humboldts, like they never bump into anything because there's never anything around because yeah. it's just water as far as the squid can see. And a cuttlefish, usually oftentimes they live on reefs where there's a ton of stuff to bump into. So they're less likely to like accidentally bump into things because they're used to navigating structure. Yeah. Still, sometimes cuttlefish will get what we call butt burn. Um, uh, where is a cuttlefish's butt? This is a complicated question. <laughs> and then we'll have different opinions on this. But I generally think of it as like the back end on the opposite side from their face. And so yeah. if they get startled, they'll jet. They'll just like scoot backwards and then whack into a wall. Over time, um, that can cause, yeah, like a little abrasion on their, their back end that we call butt burn. Um, this doesn't happen as much in the bobtails because they're couch potatoes. They just want to sit down. Um, so it makes them very, very easy to have in captivity, but not great for aquaria because you usually want an animal awake uh, when when people are awake and the bobtails are nocturnal. Yeah. So they're, just, they're just little bumps at the bottom of, of the Sometimes uh, container. Little, like, eyeballs sticking out of the sand, but yeah. that's it. Yeah. <laughs> we get this question a lot. And so I'd love to hear your take on it, Sarah. Um, the humaneness of keeping these intelligent animals. We're talking a lot about how smart they are, how a lot of times, you know, they um, they can be trained. We've we've talked a lot about how nautiluses, especially even nautiluses, which like people call like the not so smart cephalopod. Um, it, it has been proven that they can be trained, actually, and they, they react to um, us sort of like testing them. And so what is your sort of take on on the fact that we're keeping these animals and they seem really smart? This is tough. Uh, and really, it all comes down to like your um, the way you navigate the world with your ethics code. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, yeah, we get this question with cephalopods because we're always talking about how smart they are. But there are a lot of smart animals out there like rats, smart rats, enjoy being pet rats uh, like people and want to snuggle with you. Um, we do a lot to rats. Right. And nobody's really asking why. Are, do we keep rats for, for science uh, because they're so smart? Uh, why do we eat pigs? It, pigs are really smart, um, but we keep them in horrible conditions all the time to eat them. So, you know, um, sometimes when people ask, ask this question, I totally understand, but zoom out for a little bit and look at our whole system that we're living in. Um, it's bad, it's, like, it's bad all the way down a lot of the time. So um, I'm not saying don't consider the ethics of keeping cephalopods. And I really discourage people from keeping cephalopods as pets. Mm. Um, 
I think oftentimes it can result in, in an unhealthy animal. And often, also they just don't live that long, um, even in the best of conditions. So when people ask about keeping those pets, I say, don't do it. Um, Cause oftentimes, you know, you gotta be pretty good at, at, at keeping an aquarium um, to do a good job. Um, but for, for lab studies and for understanding how the oceans work and how animals uh, operate, I don't think it's different um, ethically from many of the other animal studies that we do. Yeah. Dana, I want to hear. Yeah, yeah, please. I was going to offer you chime in. I think that, that I so appreciate the way you framed that, Sarah. I really, I can tell that like you've, you've also gotten this question a lot. I think probably all of us had, and you've put some really, really lovely thought into it, which, which gave me a great idea for a sort of like where to go from there. And I think I'll, I'll start where you ended with keeping them in captivity, because the first thing that I did when I fell in love with octopuses as a 10 year old was decide that I wanted one for a pet. And even then, um, I was able to find a lot of information, almost a like shocking amount of information about how to do it well. Um, and there's even more information available now. And so I, I think that the, the, um, the inclination to sort of be hesitant about keeping one is wise and that anybody who wants to needs to do a lot of research. Um, I noticed that we have uh, Tonmo, um, the Octopus News Magazine online here as a viewer. That's actually one of the places that as a kid, I got information about how to keep cephalopods humanely and well. And so I found out that even for a tiny, tiny octopus, you need a 60 gallon aquarium. And so I had to take the time to save up the money to find one that I could afford to learn how to cycle it before putting an octopus in it. Um, so the information is out there. So I think that for if you if it's something that you want to commit to and commit to doing well, it can be done well and it can be done very humanely. And and the other thing about how short their lives are, that's why I stopped doing it. You know, I kept a few pet octopuses and those small species live for a year. That's it. So I couldn't handle it anymore after that. But, you know, kudos to the people who can. Like, you're not shortening their lifespan at all. You're probably lengthening it, honestly, because they face so many predators in the wild. But it is something to emotionally prepare yourself for. Yeah. And then for keeping them in the lab, I think I, I've reported a little bit on um, on work that's been done in recent years towards sort of increasing the amount of oversight, sort of legislative oversight and um, you know, filling out forms and making sure that your experiments are being done as ethically as possible using anesthesia when possible. All the stuff that we have in place for animals like rats um, that for a long time was not required for invertebrates and now increasingly is being required. So I feel like that system is improving um, and it's encouraging to see. Yeah, sure. yeah. And a lot of researchers, I think you've also reported on this, Dana, it, they they use a system like like the three R's system. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to, I actually don't remember what the three R's are. I, I feel like you've talked about this. Do you mind just talking quickly about what those three R's are that yeah. researchers often think about when they're doing studies like this? The idea is that you want to um, sort of uh, I, I'm trying to remember what order you, like, I know. I'm so sorry. I like sprung this on you. And replace <laughs> and like recycle. I don't think recycle is one. Not recycle, but it, <laughs> you want to say recycle. Yeah. It's reduce, too much. But the, but the re release. Yeah. No, it's release. not release. I don't know what it is. But it's, it's going to be something. I'll figure it out. Maybe you figure it out while I talk about definitely the Definitely reduce, replace. Yeah. Because reduce is making sure that you're, you have your experiment planned out enough that you know exactly how many animals you need. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that means not using too few, because if you're using just a handful and your results are not statistically significant, then it's a it's a waste of whatever experience those animals went through. Mm -hmm. So it's really thinking about what results do you need and what s sample size do you need to get that result um, and not more than that and not less than using not more than that, not less than that. And then the, the replacement is that is increasingly, again, with like new science tools, it's possible to study things like cephalopod skin by just studying cells in isolation, which is really cool stuff. Um, yeah. And I think another one had animals with exactly. Yeah. I th and I think another one had to do with like, um, if you're taking animals from the wild or if you are, um, if you're not able to breed them in the lab, is that um, is that amount that you're taking not going to harm our understand like based on our understanding of a population out in the wild, will it not harm that overall population as well? Right. So like scientists are thinking about these things and 
um, as is very clear between our conversation here too, like talking to each other pretty much constantly about these updates. So um, per Google, we're being told it's replacement, reduction, and refinement. Refinement. Yes. Thank you, Tonmo. <laughs> that. that is why um, I love live sh streams because it, it gives us the ability for other people to be um, Googling while we're talking and then update us in the chat. It's literally yeah. perfect. So thank you so much. Um, all right, so many questions from the chat. I wanna make sure we try to get to as many as possible. I really like this one. Um, as a current PhD student who's studying squid microbiomes, what was the most frustrating part about your study? Dana, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick this to you first and then Sarah will come to you. Um, well, I certainly avoided studying microbiomes. That sounds <laughs> really frustrating. <laughs> no, sorry, that's very unhelpful. Um, I'm very proud of you, that's impressive. Um, and sounds fascinating. Oh my gosh. I do feel like this question is actually like better directed to, to Sarah, but I can absolutely um, sympathize over how frustrating grad school is. Um, and I can share a little story about, uh, so I did end up having to deal with microbes because I was trying to raise these fertilized eggs, in vitro fertilized. So I've been collecting eggs and sperm from the adult Humboldt squid, mixing them in little Petri dishes and trying to get them to grow. And it turns out that's a really good way to grow bacteria and mm. algae and fungi and all kinds of things that you don't want in your Petri dishes. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what temperatures they would develop at for this question of whether they could be growing and laying eggs in California waters. And so uh, with the help of some really wonderful people in the lab, I had built this setup uh, that used uh, Peltier heating and cooling plates to keep Petri dishes at different temperatures. And so I could get the exact same batch of eggs and distribute them in the Petri dishes. And one of the most frustrating parts was that I built this amazing equipment in Monterey, California, which rarely gets above 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I took it to Mexico for my field work. <laughs> And it turned out that on a boat in the Gulf of California, it rarely got below 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Whoops. And so we had to MacGyver this whole setup with fans and uh, insulating bubble wrap to try to keep the cold babies at the correct temperature. Wow. But I want to hear about your stories too, Sarah. I mean, at any time you're a, you're a PhD student, you're going to hit walls. It's going to be frustrating. The, the things that were the most frustrating for me, um, so we, as a lab, this was like not a... Uh, me personally frustrated thing. This was like a, the whole gang was frustrated because we were trying to figure out like what are the first bacteria that establish themselves in that organ I was talking about. And we're pretty sure the answer uh, is this, this type of bacteria called verrucomicrobia. Um, and many members of that bacterial community in the accessory dimensional gland, the ANG, are pretty easy to culture in the lab. You um, you smash up an ANG, you put it on some, uh, some auger, and they grow, and they're brightly colored, and it's great. Veruca microbia? Nope. Refuse. We tried everything. We, we tried 100 different conditions. We tried changing the oxygen. We tried changing the um, vitamins. We tried all... All sorts of checking all kind of, of these boxes yeah. off as you go along, like just spreadsheets, just so many spreadsheets uh, and and attempts that that didn't work. So that was mostly my my lab mate Andrea that was um, banging her head against the wall on that one. I tried a little bit and then um, tried another frustrating thing: um, uh, getting protein, uh, like an isolated protein, um, was an absolute headache. Took me months and months and months, particularly of these experiments where I would have to be in the lab for twelve hours a day. So I would like. There were these, you know, oh. steps that were like four hours at a time, but I couldn't leave anything overnight because that would have like cooked it. Mm -hmm. That was too bad. I mean, but um, overall, you're going to make it. Talk to people. Don't be afraid to, to like ask for help and talk to people who know what they're doing. Um, talking to people is the only way we learn anything. Science is an apprenticeship. So uh, find a friend that's done it. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. I, the, yeah. I, I found that the... As soon as I feel like, oh, I've talked to all the squid octopus people, what am I going to do next year? Um, a bunch of new people show up and they start doing research. You mentioned this in your books, um, Dana, how like the sort of like emergence of all of these really new, excited scientists is like one of the one of the best parts about still being in the sciences. Um, 
All right, more questions from our audience. I like this one, and this one um, came up a few times. People were like, yes, this question. Um, Chris asks, are there any emerging adaptations to microplastics that you've known of from cephalopods? I can't imagine that we've seen that that quickly. Dana, do you have any any idea if we're seeing this at all? Nope. <laughs> Does anyone want to Google it? <laughs> I, think, I think I don't know of any. But you know, uh, speaking of bacteria, I can't believe how much I'm talking about bacteria today. But um, bacteria do a lot of cool stuff, and they can eat plastic. So oh, um, yeah. there are a lot of researchers that are specifically looking at like juicing up already like bacteria that already is capable of digesting plastic and making them even better and more efficient at it. Um, so we can stick them on the problem. Um, it's, it's not going to be enough to just, you know, to eat the garbage patch, but in some situations it may be useful. Um, none of those live in squid that I know about though. But that's a good point, Sarah. I love that you're talking about bacteria so much because really are they not the glue that holds the earth together? <laughs> Legitimately. Yeah. So yeah. the evolution of bacteria and other microbes, my, my, sorry, my I'm getting about crustaceans here. My <laughs> uh, I think I'm what to do a crab, right? <laughs> man. Carcinization of microbes. Uh, <laughs> wow, I should draw that. Anyway, uh, the evolution at the microbial scale happens so much faster than most macroorganisms evolution because the generations are turning over just like that. You know, you can have multiple generations in a day. I don't actually know what the fastest turnover of species is, but it's probably within an hour, an hour or less. Um, and all those generations, every generation you're getting recombination, you're getting mutations getting passed on to the next generation. And so that's the level at which I would expect to see evolution to that kind of thing. Um, you know, you're saying we don't, none of the bacteria that we are currently looking at that eat plastic live in cephalopods. Um, but there's nothing to say that couldn't happen someday. Um, and it's in uh, something that I read about and talked to some people about actually for my most recent book, Nursery Earth, is the symbiosis between the bacteria that are evolving super fast to the human generated change in the environment. And usually the baby animals that are taking those in that at that sort of reproductive turnover in an animal's life cycle is often where they're getting new bacteria from the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can kind of jumpstart their evolution such that we have now insect larvae that can eat plastic. Well, they, they can't digest it themselves. You know, if you look closer, it's microbes in their gut that are digesting the plastic. Plastic. Yeah. I, same with us, right? I mean, that's that's how our microbiomes work anyway. So it kind of makes sense. Um, we've got this great question. Um, how do paleontologists find things as small as cephalopod beaks or hooks in the geologic record? Uh, we're going back to like, all right, we're talking about the book. Like, yeah. it's, it's so you. much of like these ancient cephalopods, but how how do we know these things? Thank you. Uh, questioner for bringing us back to the topic at hand. We got a little bit sidetracked there. It's what happens. It's, it totally happens. Uh, this is such a good question um, because when we think about paleontologists finding bones, I think a lot of us, I know I do, have this image in our head of coming across a giant dinosaur bone. Um, you know, I think one of the most iconic images, um, certainly as as this uh, historical personage is getting more attention, is Mary Anning on the cliffs of Dover finding this huge ichthyosaur. Mm -hmm. And it was the first one anyone had ever found. Right? And you're like, OK, well, that's hard to miss. Great. Uh, but then like we need to find all these tiny, tiny bits to really piece together what's going on with not just the tiny animals, but the tiny parts of the bigger animals, the teeth and the nails and the, you know, all this, the poop, all that great stuff. Um, and they do it by being incredibly patient. Uh, it's really the, the only answer that I have. I mean, I think that there's a lot of knowledge that goes into knowing where to look because we have now generations of paleontologists mapping out where rock formations are mm -hmm. and where, at what depth rocks from different parts of the evolutionary history are likely to be. And so if you know that you're looking for something like cephalo cephalopod beaks or hooks, you go and dig in those locations where we know that those species were likely to be found, that they're, they're rocks from that era that you're looking for, maybe ammonites, or maybe you're looking older, you're looking for some of the earlier cephalopods. Um, and then, yeah, it's just a lot of patience, really. <laughs> 
yeah, as with as with most science, it's it's just a lot of patience and like kind of just luck. I think a little bit of luck. Too. luck. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've. Oh, I will right. add something um, that I feel like is true in in many aspects of science. I feel like Sarah, you probably run across this too. Is the development of a search image. Um, that our brains are really good once you've looked long enough for something. Mm -hmm. um, and it can really just be like one day where you do it for 12 hours. <laughs> You'll start dreaming. Like I would close my eyes and I would dream about plankton when I was searching for baby cephalopods in the plankton. Wow. And you could have handed me a Petri dish absolutely jammed with baby crustaceans and copepods and shrimp and all of this stuff. And I would be able to pick out the one baby squid in it because our eyes and our brains together are really good at building that search image when you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, we've got I have time for just one more audience question before we get to our final question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it over to you, Sarah, first to answer this. Do you have any advice for someone who wants to research cephalopods? Um, don't let your mom's friend tell you that you can't. Uh, that's <laughs> number one. And then... Um, also, so, okay, first of all, we have so much information available to us um, with the internet and, and everything. So um, I recommend just like learning about, learn about them as soon as you can. Um, the sooner that you know stuff, the better. And there's, a, you know, ba the barriers are so much lower than they used to be to getting access to that information. Sometimes the, the struggle now, of course, is finding correct information. Yes. Um, but going to like Google Scholar is a great way to start, get good at reading scientific articles. And then here's one that you may not have expected. Um, learn plumbing. Uh, pay attention when if there's, if there's ever like a plumber at your house. Uh, pay attention. Learn how this all works. Because any marine biologist, if they have animals in a lab, you need to know how those systems work. And plumbing skills are critical. And so let's say you're applying to work uh, for a lab um, that has cephalopods in, in the building. Um, if you say, you know, I've, I have straight A's and so does this other person applying. I, um, have worked with animals before and so does this other person applying. I know, um, how to fix a leaky faucet. Um, I would pick you over the person who doesn't know how to <laughs> fix a leaky faucet. Um, it's so critical. Um, so yeah, learn to plumb. I love that. Dana, what about you? I, it's brilliant. And I would expand on it to say not just plumbing, but a whole range of unexpected skills. Yeah. Um, and, and to find what you already feel drawn to or good at, like, you know, maybe plumbing just like you try and try and it just keeps not making sense to you. There are other skills like that that will still make you stand out that will be, you know, find what you, for for um, for at least one of the techs in my lab. It ended up being uh, learning programming skills and particularly learning to use this programming language R that's super powerful um, and nobody else in our lab knew it. She got all of us into this for data analysis, and it was transformative for everybody in the lab. Um, so I think it really it's recognizing that, uh, like, what is it that you can bring to a lab, and then what do you want out of it? Uh, so, like, what what sort of skill set can you develop and bring? And then also, what yeah, what are you looking for? It, it, like, some people want to work with cephalopods, be very hands on, and might be just as happy or even happier working in an aquarium situation. Um, than in a recent an academic research lab, um, or if it's it's more that you really want to know about them and you have some burning topic, that's really good too. Because if you know what it is, if you're more interested in behavior or genetics, if it's that if it's that RNA editing that really mm. speaks to you, all those other things, those things there are lots of labs that study behavior or study optics or study genetics, and they they may not have a cephalopod person there, but you could be that cephalopod person. Yeah, that I think it's something I didn't realize actually when I was applying to grad school is that you don't have to go to a cephalopod lab to study them. Yeah, I love that. That's it's so funny because after doing this event series for so long for cephalopod week, it, we it kind of like ebbs and flows of like what we focus on this year. We have a lot of people who have expertise in climate change and how that affects uh, squids and octopuses. Last year, it was like it was a lot of optics people, and I just like. It just happens that way sometimes. It's also like the sort of like, you know, research ebbs and flows as well of like one year, a lot of people start getting interested in RNA editing. And then a lot of like, <laughs> there's all of this stuff about CRISPR that comes out in the mid 2010s. And all of a sudden there's a lot more researchers looking to find that work. So I think paying attention to what's happening as well is just going to sort of like pique different people's interest too. So 
that's my advice as a non-squid scientist. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. So um, as we're finishing up, I know it went by so fast. Um, Sarah, do you want to um, take a few moments just to tell us about um, Skype a Scientist and just a little bit about like, I don't know, like what you love about it and why it's been so much fun to continue doing all of these years? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So my like, the thing that, in addition to studying cephalopods, working with them day to day, what really, really brings me joy is sharing science with other people. And so our organization does this in, in a bunch of different ways. One, we connect you directly with the scientists that you want to study. Maybe you're here at the cephalopod event. The thing that like really gets you going, brings you joy is nudibranchs or giraffes or uh, space uh, or something. We can get you a scientist that studies that thing. So you can have a conversation, just you, not and by you, I mean a group of you um, and and the scientists. So whether that's at your local library, you can ask your local librarian to, to set up a group or whatever we do it. It's free. We've got many, many volunteers and, and we want you to use our program because it's here for you. Um, we also do trivia nights uh, once a month. Um, you can check out those at skypeascientist.com. We do a lot of public art. And if you're like, man, I wish there was more science public art in my city, reach out to us. Uh, we can we can see about getting something started. We did this huge mural all about the biodiversity of the Delaware River. I'm here in Philadelphia. Mm. And we have like interactive science parts of that mural. Bringing science to people wherever they already are is like, hell yeah. Also, we um, are doing this little project this year. I also, I'll, I'll stop very talking. Very the posters. The posters. Yay. Yeah. So um, we got right. this like very tiny grant to do like Jersey Shore animal coasters. So, like They're this so is all cool. about horseshoe crabs. And this one's about um, sea angels. Uh, and this one is about Tina Fours. And so we, I got to hire like three local artists to depict some animals. And then the back has facts about each of the different animals. So I truly want to put science wherever people exist um, so that they don't have to come to us. We can go to them. Um, and that brings me joy. So if you want to talk more, reach out. I'm here. I love that. Again, that's Skype a scientist. So Skype that is a scientist.com. Yeah. Um, Dana, you have a new book out. You've been talking all day, all, all day with us here about um, tiny baby squid, but um, you have sort of expanded that into a new book. Can you tell us about it? We're really excited about it. I, I, I even have a copy of it. <laughs> Disappear, reappear. Um, this book, Nursery Earth, is um, is kind of like the dream book that I really wanted to write after Monarchs of the Sea. And I feel super lucky that I got to do it. So there are baby cephalopods in here. Notice they did, they, <laughs> I didn't draw this art. It's beautiful. I love it so much, but it's an octopus. It really, and it I truly is. Talked about squid in, but you know, everybody loves octopuses. I'm no exception. I love octopuses, but there is, there's a photo of one of my baby squid inside the book. And this book oh. is all about baby animals and how they connect the earth that along with microbes, they are the glue holding together all of the earth's ecosystems. I think of them as sort of little needles stitching us together in space and time because they're connecting the past to the future and they're really building the earth of the future. Um, and developmental biology across the animal kingdom is so similar. There's so many themes between a caterpillar growing up into a butterfly mm. and a puggle growing up into an echidna and a pluteus larva growing up into a sea urchin and even a human baby growing up into an adult human. And I just had so much fun talking to scientists from all different fields and pulling it all together into that book. Um, and as long as I'm talking about babies, I also yes. need to very quickly plug this book, um, which is not about baby animals, but it is for young humans, ages about 10 and up. I have been told that adults also enjoy reading it, and I wrote it because I wanted to read it. And it's got uh, Argonaut octopuses, the sailor octopuses of the Mediterranean, and it's got the story of a lady scientist from the 1830s who totally smashed conventional wisdom and invented the first aquariums. Amazing. All right. And in the last moments we have together, I do have to ask you this question. What is your favorite cephalopod? Dana, go. Vampire squid. Vampire squid. Oh, amazing. Okay, Sarah, you've had a few more seconds to think about it. Favorite. I already knew immediately. Magna Pinna. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I just joined a sticker club. Uh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, okay. um, it is, um, this is Meg Minlin's uh, sticker yeah. club, by the way. She is the inverted babe on TikTok and Instagram. And um, it is the stickers of my dreams. Um, they're spooky. I don't like them. 
<laughs> I like them so much because they're so spooky. They're the ones that have the like, um, the like elbows. The elbow squid. I yeah, the elbows. I, I just, that brings me joy. They're, I like um, them so much. They're big fin squid. Is that their um, big fin squid? The, yeah. the complicated part is that there are two squid that are called big fin. Um, there's beautiful shallow water like reef squid. Mm -hmm. uh, these like rainbow gorgeous charismatic they like cuttlefish. They right? do. Yeah, they have a fin that goes all the way around, so they look a bit like cuttlefish. And then the um, other big fin is Magna Pinna, and they live like the deepest they've been seen is 3.8 miles below the surface. They're the deepest squid we've seen. No, thank you. Um, I'm Whereas so, vampire squid are the only ones that eat poop, so, so I mean they're doing they're doing uh, the work that we refuse to do. So <laughs> That's right. and they're one of the longest lived cephalopods that we know of. The vampire squid, very yeah. cool. They are really uh, cool, actually. Not nearly really as spooky cool. as their name. Uh, no, no, sound, they're so. they're kind of sweet, really. Yeah, <laughs> um, strawberry squid is my favorite one. So um, very good choice. Thank very good. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much, Sarah and Vanna. It has been just so lovely to talk with you and to right in the middle of cephalopod week, we are cep uh, cephalobrating with you both. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, in the chat, I have uh, linked a uh, link to our uh, Science Friday book club page. So if you want to learn more about Monarchs of the Sea or any other books that we are reading um, and Dan's Somebody asked me to hold the books up again, so oh, I'm, that's... I'm only doing what the audience demands. Please do. Um, <laughs> Good. Yes. yes hold it Sarah, up. art. Hold Yay. <laughs> are those um, stamps? Those, those are, are they're prints. Yeah, they're like lino cuts. I made a bunch of um, cards today. That's what it's, I spent. It's hard having such talented people in your life. Um, they will just hold <laughs> up their work forever. All right. So really quickly, Science Friday Book Club. We read a new book every month. Next month, we are reading a book called Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. It is all about uh, mushrooms. Yes. Uh, but not really mushrooms. It's really about the mycelium that live underneath the soil. So really cool stuff. I hope you'll join us. We're getting, we're getting into the soil after this whole month in the ocean. So I hope you'll continue to join us. Data. Sarah, it has been just a hoot being here with you all. Happy Cephalopod Week. Happy Cephalopod Week to all of you in the chat. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great night. Happy Thanks, Cephalopod Rob. Week. Happy Cephalopod Week. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.